Okay, Pramp, welcome back to the uh, last segment of the Independent Doctors of Pramp. I'm Dr. Michael Ryan, your host tonight. Uh, and there is a live call-in line. I want to remind everybody of that number at 727-8750. Uh, we've had a couple of good callers and good questions, and uh, um, the uh, last caller did talk about a vegan diet and, and again, plant-based uh, uh, diet in reduction of diabetes, and I, and I do support that diet, and I support anything that uh, causes people to... Uh, lose weight. Sometimes when you get into a strict diet, one of the things that people have a problem is they get restricted in what they can eat and don't eat. Um, I've talked about caloric reduction. Um, I think it's very important to uh, reduce the calories in your diet, remembering that uh, one pound equals 3,500 calories, so that if you eliminated 100 calories from your diet a day, whether that be through diet or exercise, and hopefully it's a combination of both, uh, you would lose 10 pounds a year. 200 calories is 20 pounds. And vice versa, if you ate an extra 10 calories per day consistently for 20 years, you would gain 20 pounds. Um, so keep that in mind uh, when you started a diet. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, and if you gained 30 pounds in the last three years, you can certainly lose 30 pounds in the next three years. You do not have to take it off, and I advise people not to take off weight quickly. It is not a very good and safe way of doing that. It needs to come off slowly with a steady diet reduction. Um, I remember when I switched from a... Uh, a normal diet to what I would call eating whatever I wanted to eat to a low carbohydrate diet. I, you know, I had headaches and I kind of went through some carbohydrate withdrawals and I did eventually lose about 30 pounds um, uh, and, and it does work. Uh, but I don't know what kind of stress you actually place on your body when you don't do things gradually. Um, and remember, you didn't gain your weight overnight, so don't try and lose it overnight. Um, and I don't really support diet pills. Um, they do have their place in, in getting people a head start. I don't support surgery, um, even though drastic measures do sometimes, uh, you know, drastic issues do support drastic measures. Um, but I've seen a lot of people who have had bypass surgery who do lose weight, um, but they suffer some nutritional losses um, and that may be important in other disease processes and over time they do manage to gain their weight back. Um, so it is a, a lifestyle modification. Uh, let's go back to the slides that we were talking about um, and um, I want to talk about the egg yolk thing. I want to review this slide briefly before we went to break. Uh, again, this slide illustrates uh, part of the misinformation maybe that we have been giving people for years, which is staying away from um, cholesterol-based foods like eggs, uh, in particular, there's a lot of good nutritional value from good raised eggs uh, that we may be missing out. So when I do a dietary history on patients and I ask them when their blood sugars are difficulty and I ask them, what do you have for breakfast? And invariably, most of them are having cereal, oatmeal, Cheerios, things of that nature. Well, I'm sorry, that's actually the wrong thing to eat in the morning. It should be more protein-based foods uh, and eggs are one of those things that you could substitute back in your diet and your cholesterol will not be changed that much. But when you add eggs and then you start adding cheeses and breads and other issues to it, then yes, you might start having a problem. But eggs by themselves are definitely not a bad food source. Um, going to the next slide, let's talk about uh, this low carbohydrate diet uh, and what some of the research uh, talks about that they never have really, they know decrease or uh, change your LDL cholesterol. Um, and that low-carb diets were associated with significant decreases in body weight, which is where they're important. Uh, and this improves cardiovascular risk. It also in decreases triglycerides, blood sugar, uh, and body mass index. And body mass index is one of those things we tra trace to the sleep apnea study, uh, the sleep apnea issues that I talked before. So you can see that high carbohydrate diets cause weight gain. They cause abdominal obesity, uh, which causes decreased testosterone in males, which causes sleep apnea, which causes fatigue. Um, and all of those things go to this basically high carbohydrate diet, which we got to from being afraid of cholesterol in the 80s. And this is where it all comes together. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that uh, it's not so important for you to eliminate 
uh, the cholesterol in your diet as much as it is to watch your carbohydrate load. This is where we get into trouble. Again, remember that call in line you see is 727 8750. Um, we just have a few more minutes left in the show, so if there's a burning question you have, uh, feel free, uh, please feel free to call in. Um, let's go to uh, one of these things that I, uh, is very important information. I want to make sure I get this in. Uh, this was actually a, an excerpt from a, a recent uh, New England uh, Journal uh, article where basically one of the prof uh, people that were involved in the development of this cholesterol uh, heart disease model puts this in there, which is a low-fat, higher-carbohydrate diet may well have played an unattended role in the current epidemics of obesity, lipid abnormalities, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic, metabolic syndrome. This diet can no longer be defended uh, by the appeal to the authority to a prestigious medical organizations. And what that means is, is that the rethinking of where we are today with regards to diet and what we regard to the carbohydrates is affecting this whole paradigm shift in, in uh, cholesterol and heart-related disease. Um, and one of the things I talked about at the end of the last show, uh, which was this, that um, when you eat a certain amount of sugars, and this is this diabetic high lipid model, this diabetic model, we, uh, when you go to the doctor and they check, let's go to this next slide because I think it's um, what we talk about here. When they check your cholesterol, um, your cholesterol again is not soluble in blood, it's carried in lipoproteins called HDL, LDL, and VLDL. So when you go to the doctor and he checks your blood cholesterol, he's going to give you a total number, um, total cholesterol, your total HDL, your, uh, and, and he's going to come to some ratios. And he's going to try and make some sense of this, this, these, these numbers. Um, and what I'm going to try and explain to you that if you've got a total LDL number, let's suppose it was 150. Uh, your total cholesterol, your LDL was 150, your total cholesterol was 200 for the purpose of the remaining discussion tonight. Um, if you are a non-diabetic, that LDL represents a combination, it's actually a calculated number, um, but it actually uh, represents uh, the total sum of LDL particles in your bloodstream. Now LDL is the actual particle which we believe is important, most important in promoting cholesterol related disease. Now obviously there are other environmental factors that, that cause that, but imagine that your artery or your basically your bloodstream is the freeway and the cars on that freeway are basically lipoproteins and the people inside those cars are the actual cholesterol particles. So if you're if you get a number of 150 and you're non-diabetic, that usually represents probably the true number of LDL particles in your bloodstream um, and some representation of that number. If you're a diabetic, that's a totally different story, meaning because of the way your fat stores handle fat and sugar, you make a different type of cholesterol. You, instead of having 150 cars on the freeway carrying your LDL, you may have 400 cars on the freeway carrying your cholesterol. But the sum of those smaller cars, a Lincoln compared to a Fiat, is basically the difference. Now, it could be that the smaller particle LDLs, because they can still you know, affect your, your tissues, they can still bump into your arterial walls, are more efficient at depositing that cholesterol into your cells and into your lining. Um, and so what do doctors do? Well, it's really not easy to change someone's diet, but it is easier to prevent the liver from making cholesterol. And so if we give you a statin and lowers your LDL from 100 to one to 150 to 100, have we really made a huge difference in your cholesterol particles? And that, in the previous model, all you'll see is 100, and the doctor will pat you on the back and say, hey, you did a great job. But if you're a diabetic, you still have about 300 fiats running through your system 
or smaller cholesterol particles. And this is why it is so important for, for diabetics and pre-diabetics and insulin resistant pa patients to lower that HbA1c. I would much rather have a patient with an HbA1c under six, okay, and a cholesterol of 150 than I would have someone have an HbA1c of eight and an LDL of 100. That patient with the LDL of 100 and, an, and a higher elevated blood sugar is going to be more at risk of heart disease than the patient on the other hand. And that is because your body makes more of these small particle cholesterols. And, and, and viewers, if, if you take anything home tonight, it is to control your carbohydrate intake. Weight loss reduces cardiovascular risk, it reduces abdominal obesity, it reduces so many other diseases. Watch your food, watch your calories, and you can affect heart disease, sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes more effectively by doing a proper diet than you would ever taking a bunch of medication. I know exercise may be hard for some people, but you have to buy better quality food and you have to eat less of it. Rome wasn't built in a day, your body was wasn't built in a day. I would encourage you to really seek out different diets, whatever you can find on the web, whatever information, buy better food. If you buy better food, people that produce better food will be more profitable and then the bad producers of food will actually be forced to change the way they make food, therefore making better food um, easier to obtain. Remember, you vote with your pocketbook buy better food, eat better, and reduce your caloric intake. That's about all the time I have for tonight. I thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you find this show informational. Remember, we do call in. If you want to call in next week about what I talked about this week, please feel free to do so. Until then, have a good night, Pahrump. We'll see you next Monday night.